Well, <clears throat> I appreciate you guys having me here today, and um, uh, I'll tell you a little story. It was um, these two old drunks were sitting in a bar and drinking, and one turns to the other and he says, "See those two old guys over there? That's going to be us in ten years." He said, "You dummy! That is us. That's a mirror." <laughs> So what you don't want to have happen is be the guy sitting there looking in the mirror and say, what the hell, heck happened for the last 10 years? And uh, where did I lose that time or how did this sneak up on me? Uh, and so we're going to go over just some statistics and, and some data just to give you an idea of the problem. So on the handouts up there that we've given out, you've got uh, a little map up at the top. And it's just a graphic representation of the death rates by county in the United States for cardiovascular disease. And it's just if you, if you look where we're sitting and you look kind of where you'd expect it to be, you know, that south, southeastern United States, and it goes uh, for the coastline there, you can almost follow where the chicken fried steak and the gravy gets served. Right? <clears throat> and you head out to those healthier states in Colorado where they eat, you know, barley and nuts and things and not so much. So the first thing is to identify uh, some of your own risk factors. And, you know, one of the things we always encourage everybody to do is you need to get your physical. You need to know your numbers. Uh, and, and that's an easy thing to do. A lot of times people want to, you know, put their head in the sand. They don't want to know what that is. But just like in any of these businesses that you guys are involved in, if you don't know what your numbers are for your business, you can't manage that business. If you don't know what your numbers and data are for your health, you're going to have a hard time managing your health and making sure that uh, you're making progress with it. So just just to some general numbers, you know, every 25 seconds you got an American having a coronary event. 33.5% uh, of adults over the age 20 uh, are going to have hypertension, and that number is growing because we're seeing disease states in our uh, young people at a rapid rate due to uh, issues in their uh, weight and, and obesity issues and in their diets. Uh, so that's going to climb. In 2008, a third of the deaths were due to cardiovascular disease before the age of 75, uh, which still, ex still is before the average life expectancy of 77.9 years. And that's a blended number for men and women. So men, it's still down about 73.9. Women are closing in on 80. So risk factors, cholesterol, cholesterol and triglycerides, you need to know what your lipids are. And that's a simple blood test. And you want to make sure uh, you get uh, that drawn and it preferably get a more sophisticated test done that's called a VAP test, VAP test, and that actually measures the LDL. Know what your blood pressure is. Uh, that's an easy one to check. And you know, normal blood pressure should be under 130 on the systolic or top number and under 80 on the bottom. Um, salt, big contributor to hypertension. And if you, uh, they will tell us statistically salt is causing more health issues in this country than even uh, diabetes or sugar is. So uh, the average American diet today has twice the amount of sodium in it that it did 10 years ago. And it's all the packaged processed foods. So do what you can to avoid that. Obviously, uh, diabetes and prediabetes, just being diabetic is equivalent to somebody who's already had a heart attack as far as future risk. So, you know, oftentimes I get the patients and they say, well, you're, you're diabetic and they go, well, I'm controlling it. And it's like, yeah, but, you know, you're basically in the risk group now with that guy that, you know, has had a heart attack. Uh, smoking, obviously, uh, is a risk factor, but uh, hopefully the rates continue to fall down. Uh, lack of physical activity, if you're not exercising at least three times a week, it's going to increase your risk. Um, there's some other biometrics. Men with a waist size greater than 40 inches and 33 inches, uh, th excuse me, 35 inches in women, uh, just your biometric of you know, have that visceral adiposity, you're putting fat in your belly, is going to raise one's risk factor up. Uh, stress, eating five to seven servings of fruit and vegetables, not enough of that going around. Uh, family history, obviously, for heart disease, and uh, you want to screen and check the, your risk factors uh, as far as what contributed to your family's heart disease. And then lack of sleep, which is another overall contributor, and that's just due to the stress levels. Your body needs time to regenerate and preserve itself. Um, so things you can do. I told the, the uh, I think I was telling Candy that, you know, you go see the doctor and you get your physical, what did he tell you to do? Eat better, eat, exercise more, and get better sleep. It's like, really, I just paid for that? Because I could have read that off the back of, uh, uh, you know, anybody could have told me, but it's true. I mean, you got to get the exercise in. The message is you don't have to run marathons. Get out and move, work up a sweat. You know, yard work, housework, those things all count. Uh, get more physical activity. Uh, get your rest. 
uh, watch the nutrition, uh, really read those labels, watch out for the hidden. Uh, we've got some uh, demo of that. We've got a little demo of what plaque looks like within the coronary arteries that you can pass around. And so, you know, this stuff doesn't come up all of a sudden is what happens is there's an injury to the lining of the vessel of the wall and during the reparative process as the body's healing that, uh, it uh, starts to form basically a scar. That plaque will fracture or rupture and you get platelets stick to it and it forms a clot and you get acute coronary uh, thrombosis and uh, you end up with a heart attack if you don't get to the hospital and have that uh, thrombosis either removed with a catheter or they use embolic medications to, to, to dissolve it. So heart disease, type 2 diabetes, another big contributing. So we just talked, said diabetes is equivalent to uh, risk factor for heart diseases if you'd had known heart disease. So, you know, 70% of the U.S. population is uh, overweight or obese right now. A uh, big contributor, and even those who aren't, we see even folks who don't necessarily have weight issues coming in with elevated blood sugars. Um, when you eat a sugar, that is, a, a meal that's high in sugar or have big sugar intake, even if you're not diabetic, you get a big spike in insulin to bring those blood sugars down, and that uh, spike in insulin is inflammatory. And that inflammation is one of those things that can set up the, the, the damage to the lining of the artery that progresses on to plaque. So every time you eat a high sugary meal, it's raising the risk of uh, coronary artery disease down the road. Uh, diabetic complications, some of which people are pretty aware with. One that's a new one uh, is because we're doing a better job at keeping these people alive longer and they're, uh, they're actually going to start having liver failure. And so used to they didn't stay alive long enough for that. Now they'll tell us the liver transplant list is going to double in the next ten, 10 years and most of that's going to be due to the, the diabetes. Uh, knowing your risk, again weight is an issue, blood pressure puts you at risk because of the uh, stress it's putting on the body, cortisol levels go up, family history can do it, there are genetic markers for some of the types of, of cancer. Uh, excuse me. Um, the uh, uh, eating processed carbohydrates, sugary foods can do it, L lack of uh, regular exercise and not having enough of the fruits and vegetables. You do want to remember fruit is a, uh, a sugar and so it should be in moderate quantities, it's really get those vegetables. So, eat better, exercise more, and get some rest. Any questions? <laughs> Surviving 2013, and these are little worksheets you can kind of go through uh, that may help you set some goals. So, you know, one of the things that we do is we give people uh, metrics, whether it be lab results, uh, blood pressure, heart rate, uh, blood sugar levels, et cetera, that you can monitor and see and, uh, if you can make improvements and you come back and remeasure those. This is kind of the same exercise for uh, in each individual and we'll go through it quickly, but uh, you know, exercise, making some goals that are measurable to increase one's exercise, working on improving the sleep patterns uh, and, and getting your full seven and a half, eight hours a night, skin safety, avoiding the sun, using sunscreens are out there, working on uh, nutrition uh, and working on a balanced diet and working to get those processed uh, carbs out of there. Um, you know, I tell, keep it simple, stupid thing is clean, lean, and green. Clean meaning stay away from the processed packaged foods. If it's got a barcode on it, don't eat it. Uh, lean is high protein, low carbohydrate. And then the green is get all the vegetables you can every chance you can, especially the green ones. Uh, stress management uh, is important that keep those cortisol levels down. They're inflammatory. Um, you know, laugh often, enjoy yourself. There's studies showing if you just uh, hold a pencil in your mouth and you smile, make a smiling motion, it actually releases the happy hormones in one's brain, the serotonin. So the smiling helps uh, with mental health as well. Uh, supplements is an over overused and underused in that uh, many Americans are taking supplements but what they're taking is not being absorbed or giving them the benefit that it should so everybody needs to take supplements regardless of how uh, clean and healthy ones eating the USDA tests our produce on an annual basis for nutritional values and some of the micronutrients in our uh, produce are down by as much as 36 percent over the last decade or two due to two main reasons genetic engineering and also to commercial farming techniques where they deplete the soil so you know the example is if you keep that potted plant in the house you've got to repot it every once in a while because all the the nutrients in that soil get taken up by the plant and if you don't repot it, it shrivels up and, and, and doesn't do well. Uh, the other is that the uh, commercial uh, genetic engineering of the produce, you can go buy these carrot nubs, you can put them in your refrigerator, they won't go bad for months, okay? 
go buy an organic carrot and put it in your refrigerator and you better consume it in a day or two because it'll start shriveling up within a couple, three days. And that's because those nubs have been genetically engineered. They're not bad for you, but they don't contain the nutrition that good healthy stuff, uh, organic, uh, and, and uh, where they don't use the pesticides. Even organics changed. It used to be to be organic. You had to uh, rest the land every 10 years. The uh, USDA has lifted that so they can continually farm that land. You know, the old smart farmer knew he had to rotate, rotate his crops uh, to get the best crops, uh, but that's gone by the wayside. They, they're getting two crops out of them. Questions on that? I had a couple on the, uh, on the sleep. It says, you know, avoid television, computers, smartphones. Um, what about, like, music? I mean, is that going to Category as well. No, the problem with those devices that you said was that they emit blue light, and our eyes interpret blue light as being daytime. And so when you're exposed to that, and I, you know, I'm always amazed at the emails I get from patients having a problem and it's time stamped at 1 a.m. You know, it's like, really, you're on your, I mean, get it done, get your emails done when you get home and, and go read a book by natural, you know, light and, and, and try, there's actually bulbs you can buy to put in your reading lamps that uh, emit less blue light. Uh, but that's why it's talking about those devices. So the labs that you get when you, when you have a physical, are they, do they find everything? I guess that's what I'm trying to say. How, how, how much research do you ask for when, when you take blood work and, and ask for lab results? Well, we distinguish it by the fact that, you know, most of the time if you go into your primary care physician's office for a physical, you're getting a limited amount of lab work. They may check a blood count, uh, your lipid panel, kidney liver functions, check a blood sugar for diabetes. They may check thyroid. That's usually it. There's no uh, uh, usually evaluation for nutritional status or hormone status involved in that. Well, we do it at our executive medicine of Texas. I think it's, what, 90-something labs we check? 86. 86 labs that are on the lab sheet uh, that are in there. And you'll find some that can be off and others off. And these are in healthy, otherwise healthy individuals that if I did that basic set, it's not going to show it. The healthiest people we have come back and we don't have to ask them to come in and check labs. They'll come back and check them. They'll say, you know, I've changed this. I've been taking, you know, alpha lipoic acid to see if it helps bring down my average blood sugar, draw my A1C and tell me what it is uh, with, without us having to drag them back in. Down the road that we can come up with a product that we can sell. So they looked forward 10 years and developed these products. Testosterone is a naturally occurring substance. You can't have a patent on it, so they have a patent on either the cream or the delivery mechanism is it. And uh, they put their products out there and then they created the demand. You know, they started putting articles in the newspapers about how this is a growing problem and seeded the market and then they started running their ads. And so now there's a great awareness out of it. That's not a bad thing. Problem is their products don't do a whole lot for replacing it because it's not a, a strong enough uh, concentration to really raise levels. Um, so men and women, two things that contribute to the aging process or trigger it more than anything else, inflammation and hormones. And so when we talk hormone replacement, uh, I always tell them there's hormone replacement and there's hormone optimization. Replacement means I can give a woman just enough estrogen to make her hot flashes and such go away um, and she's fine. She, her symptoms are gone, but that's not optimized. I mean, there's, and women need testosterone too, and often those postmenopausal women are low on testosterone, which accounts for their sleep disturbances, their you know, cognitive issues where they say, I just can't think as clear as I used to. They lose lean muscle mass. They go up two dress sizes, even though their weight is staying the same. Uh, all that's mostly due to low testosterone levels. You replace those testosterone levels, and if necessary, estrogen levels, and those gals will perform and feel a lot better. And so you're hearing more about that. But that's part of aging. It's never covered by health plans for the most part. And some doctors would tell you there's no medical reason for replacing a woman's hormones, uh, testosterone in particular, much less they'll tell you that it's uh, at risk to put a woman on uh, estrogens, which isn't true. If you use bioequivalent, uh, the data says that there's no increased risk. In fact, there's evidence that there's a decreased risk of cancer. You gotta remember, we all in this room have this disease called aging, all right? Cancer, hypertension, diabetes, coronary artery disease, these aren't diseases so much as they're symptoms of this bigger disease called aging. And anything you can do to slow down that aging process is going to help you stay away from these other symptoms down below it. And so the five things in order of importance uh, for slowing that aging process, one, don't smoke. If you're doing that, everything else is for naught. So work your best to get away from the smoking. 
Two, exercise has a bigger effect than anything else that, uh, except for smoking cessation. It's get a sweat up three or four times a week. Three, the nutrition, clean, lean, and green. Four, supplements, get a good pharmaceutical grade, multivitamin, vitamin D, and omega-3s. Some people need more vitamin D than others. You can get your levels checked when you do the labs. Five, hormone optimization. And then there's chemicals out there that, such as resveratrol and astragalus root that have been demonstrated to slow the aging process. All right? And that research was done by a guy named David Sinclair at Harvard. Uh, um, he, what resveratrol does is it protects the telomeres, these little caps on the end of our DNA that uh, every time a cell divides, that gets a little shorter and a little shorter until eventually that cell can no longer replicate its DNA. It's the aging process at a cellular level. Uh, when that happens, that cell dies. If enough cells die, you get tissue death. If enough of the tissue dies, you get organ death, and then you get organism death. Um, you can preserve and slow the rate of deterioration of those telomeres down by using substances like resveratrol and astragalus root. And his research showed that just resveratrol alone would add 10 to 15 years on the human life. And those are healthy years because you've slowed the aging process. It doesn't mean 10 more years uh, you know, in an aged, decrepit state. You're going to slow it down and, and look and feel younger uh, as you age. Um, I always tell the antidote is that here in town at UT Southwestern, a group is looking at cancer cells because they don't age. That's the problem, all right? They just divide and divide in, indefinitely till they kill the organism. So they're looking at ways to turn on the aging process in cancer cells to make therapy more effective. So the re basic science research they're doing in cancer is very similar to what the age management people are doing and how do we turn it off in the healthy cells. And uh, they share the same basic science stuff. And when these guys figure out how to turn it on in cancer cells, they'll win a Nobel Prize. When, when these guys figure out how to turn it off in healthy cells, they'll sell billions of dollars of pharmaceuticals. <laughs> but that's what will happen. So how often lab results and adjusting, adjusting supplements that do you, do you think, say, a person that's 50 years old would, would require? Well, Any time you make a change, you want to come back and measure it. So just like in your business, if you said, we're going to change the way we do process X, you're going to come back in some defined period and come back and measure, did that change and give me the result I want, or you're not going to keep going with that change. So if you make a change in something, and it may be, OK, great, I changed my exercise pattern. My testosterone wasn't as high as I'd like it to be. I'll change. Hey, doc, how long does it take for that to show up? And it varies. You know, but three to six months usually is what it's going to do. I started on the supplements. I want to see if there's been a difference in my vitamin D levels and, and those things. Three to six months. Uh, you know, if it's something that we routinely check, and I left off PSA for men over the age of 50, but for prostate-specific antigen where you're screening for prostate cancer, uh, if it's going up, we may say come back in three months and let's keep a closer eye on it. Generally, prostate cancer is pretty slow growing, so you're not losing too much time, but you don't want to send that individual out for, you know, unnecessary biopsies if that's just a, a slight spike in their uh, PSA and it may come back down. So is it every quarter, twice a year? About that. I mean, and so if you're pretty stable, if nothing's changed, I mean, you know, I did a physical on a guy this morning, everything, he's doing really well. I mean, you know, he exercises a lot, his percent body fat's down. There's not a whole lot he needs to come back and change. His cholesterol was good, everything, you know, that was all good. Um, so he probably won't come back for six months. I mean, he really doesn't have anything changed other than he wants to know, uh, you know, what's my testosterone doing. He wants to pull the trigger on it before it gets to be a problem. Question. Um, I know you advocate limiting uh, sun exposure for the obvious reasons, but I've also heard that some people are going to the other extreme and they're not outdoors and they're not outside enough to really be processing their vitamin D. What are your thoughts on that? Well, to get enough vitamin D, it you know, depends on where your latitude is. And I, have, I have the arguments with the dermatologist because I like being outside. But you can be outside and, and get sun exposure and use sunscreen safely. If you do that, you're going to block out the majority of the rays uh, that uh, help your body, your skin, make the vitamin D. So you can look for other sources. I mean, the, the only good food source for vitamin D is cold water fish. Uh, cod, halibut, salmon, and such. Uh, actually, farm-raised catfish is not bad because the, the meal they feed those catfish uh, actually has vitamin D in it. Um, but I wouldn't touch a wild-caught catfish. I mean, you know, really a bottom feeder? 
Not so good. Yes, ma'am. You uh, mentioned pharmaceutical grade uh, vitamins and things like that. I guess that's not what they have at Costco. No. Okay. So where do we, where do we get the that brand? It, there's, they're out there, but you have to look for them. I mean, we carry a line that's made by Douglas Lab at our pharmacy, I mean, at our um, uh, office here in Southlake. Uh, Douglas uh, distributes only through physicians' offices. Um, you know, Advocare, Shackley, and GNC has some. Uh, but if you go ask the salesperson, they oftentimes don't even know what you're talking about with, when you say pharmaceutical grade. And just for clarification, what that means is that company has, one, verified that they're absorbed, so they usually have less filler in them. And they also verify that what they say they have in them, they have in them within some standard of measure, and it varies, some plus or minus 5%, but generic medications are allowed to have plus or minus 30%, and that's roughly what uh, most of, the, of these uh, supplement companies that are making them or testing them out at. But your Centrum, they, FDA requires nothing of them, and you can go look, Consumer Reports did it, I think, summer before last, and Centrum and one a day didn't even get a star. They're not absorbed, and they don't even have in them what they say. And so if those aren't good, I guarantee you, Costco is crap. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so what's your address? <laughs> Actually, you stayyoungvitamins.com is where you go. Stayyoungvitamins.com stay young. okay. is where the ones he's talking about you can get. So here's the reason you want to take care of yourself. Lots of reasons, but you know, I get guys come in the office and you know they're 70, 75 now, and they've got a few problems, and you know, but they're not too bad, and they're doc. If I'd known I was going to live this long, I would have taken better care of myself. Well, with the things that are coming down in regenerative medicine and some of the other things that will prolong our life, such as resveratrol, which will probably be in a pharmaceutical form here within a few years, um, we're going to add easily 10, 15, 20 years on to that number that was given there at 79. The fastest growing group in the United States uh, demographically right now is centenarians, people over 100. And it's going to continue to be that way at a much more rapid pace than it even is now. Um, so that group is going to be there for a long time. And then 20 years from now, it'll be the guy coming in at 95 saying, you know, or 90 saying, Doc, if I'd known I was going to live this long, I would have taken better care of myself. Well, you don't want to be that guy or that gal. You want to start taking better care of yourself now so you can say, man, I'm glad I took that advice and did, made those life changes and, and slowed that down, and I'm doing pretty good compared to my friends. So I did a radio show with Larry North on Sunday after we got off. Uh, he, we commented, and he said, you know, I've been running all these people I haven't seen in 10, 15 years, and they, they look really old, you know? And his girlfriend's name for her fiance is Brenda. He says, I'm always asking Brenda. Is, he goes, Brenda, you gotta, do I look that old? You gotta tell me. And you know, he, Larry's 51, 52, and he, uh, he, did, he looks pretty good for, uh, really good for a guy his age. And he's like, I said, you know, I have the same observation. You go back to high school reunions and see these guys, and it's like, God, you know, they look 60 years old, 70 years old, and I know they're only my age, they're 50. And, uh, and so, you know, it does make a difference. The more you do now, it, it's additive. Um, so you figure you're going to make it to 100, engage it that way, and uh, implement some strategies. I mentioned regenerative medicine, just as a note, that's stem cells. And so the ability to uh, replace joints, uh, you know, they talked about the liver transplants, uh, they'll be able to grow new livers. They're already doing uh, corneas, they already do bladders, they do cartilage already uh, out of stem cells. So regenerative medicine is going to allow us to uh, keep people healthy or alive uh, longer without the rejection issues because they're basically using their own tissues. They're not having to look for donors or use uh, uh, metal plates for knees and things like that. So.